Thank you for joining me today. Hello from Canada. Wish I could be there with you all. I'm going to welcome my presentation, Preserving Atrocity, Trauma, and the Broadcast Media Archivist. Um, so there are a few points that I'm going to touch upon today. Um, one is kind of go through the Association of Moving Image Archivists Salary and Demographic Survey that we put together a few years ago, just to kind of get a general sense of um, current state of media archivist mental health. Um, then move on a little bit to experiences that can kind of be shared between people in broadcast media, like journalists and archivists, you know, just getting a sense of some of the similarities and differences when working with um, difficult material. Some of this is anecdotal from my own networks, um, because I know people who work in the Canadian media broadcast industry, both in you know, the newsroom as well as the archives. Um, then move on to maybe some concepts, emerging theories in archival theory that directly relate to difficulty working with tra traumatic material in broadcast media archives and even beyond. And lastly, um, I find knowledge mobilization to be critical. So I kind of want to also include some potential strategies for support. Um, so first start with the EMEA salary and demographic survey. So in 2021, um, EMEA conducted a survey that looked more to learn about who makes up their membership. So survey questions were related to identity, education, debt, um, income, what have you. Um, and for the purposes of this presentation, statistics that I kind of wanted to make note of were number of participants that identified it as having maybe just some sort of disability or as well as maybe some difficulty with mental health. Um, there were over 500 respondents. Um, well, a large majority of the respondents were from the United States. Um, I don't believe a similar survey has been done in Canada or in the UK. So, you know, hopefully it's something we can perhaps investigate in the next few years. So one of our questions was, you know, do you identify as a person with a disability or as a neurodivergent person? Um, and the results were 16.5% you know, yes, 79.1% no, and 4.5 prefer not to specify. You know, unfortunately, that yes number of statistics is quite lower than national, many national averages. Um, so I think that's something we need to be working on in the field. But for uh, the purposes of this presentation, um, as you can see, when we're looking at, you know, rates of mental health, like looking at depression, anxiety, mental health issues, you know, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, we had 36% of respondents saying that they did have that, um, which is a lot higher than many national averages and just kind of maybe speaks about the workforce a little bit. Um, so moving on to, you know, the journalist and, and archivist. Um, like I said, I've, I know people who work in Canadian media broadcasting, you know, both as journalists and as archivists and just thinking about, you know, their training and education and, and, and what have you. Um, and, you know, I was spoke, spoke to my contact in the newsroom and he said, while not easy, you know, they were prepared to work with difficult material. You know, it was part of their training. Um, you know, there was journalist mental health initiative workshops, um, you know, because, you know, a lot of the media broadcasters and, and, and journalists are going to be on the front lines. They're going to be seeing this material, I, I mean, as it happens and report on it. Whereas my archivist connection, they said they were not prepared for what they were working with. Um, they were someone who wasn't necessarily being trained in, in working in journalism. They were trained in an audiovisual preservation program. And it was the archive that, you know, that was where they got their job, right? So they didn't necessarily have that same level of, of, of training of working with difficult material. They weren't necessarily prepared to work with that material. And some of those train that those mental health initiatives weren't there. Um, and you know, when working with audiovisual archival material, especially in something like a media, like a broadcast archive, you know, you might not be sure what you're coming across. Um, you know, this was maybe footage that was never broadcast, problematic language and records being used, and, and inspecting and problematic material. Um, 
again, just, you know, this idea of reliving this atrocity by constantly inspecting and reinspecting this material. So I thought, I've seen, you know, there's some archival concepts for consideration. Um, the idea of the, the person-centered archive, um, looking at archival bias and lived experience and trauma-informed archival practice. Um, so first of all, design, um, defined person-centered archives. So this came from a call or a, an issue of the journal Archivaria. Um, so Dr. Jennifer Douglas was talking about defining the person-centered theory of archival care broadly um, as theory that shifts attention from the record where it has traditionally been almost exclusively focused to the people that create, keep, use, and or are represented in archives and records. You know, person-centered approaches are evident in and across recent archival scholarship that explores radical empathy, affect, intimacy, the body, disability, dismantling white supremacy, indigenization, and ethics of care. Um, and, you know, I think this idea of care in the archive, you know, has long been about the preservation of objects over necessarily the individuals. Um, you know, but you mean to kind of broaden this care to encompass the archivist and the impact that we have on the material we're preserving. Um, and, you know, there's even a difference between, say, a user-centered archive and a person-centered archive. You know, both emphasize the human over the collection or object. The difference is that the person-centered approach includes the care of those in the archive beyond, you know, the user. But, you know, the donor and archivist, for example, which might not be the related to broadcast media archives exclusively, but something to keep in mind. Um, and archival bias, you know, I'm sure... Many of us are aware at this point that archives are not neutral spaces and, you know, by association, it also means archivists themselves are not neutral. Um, you know, we all have our inherent biases that will you know, kind of find a way to creep into our work, even if it's unconscious. You know, our work is guided by our lived experiences. You know, so how might this archival bias or lived experience play in processing difficult material? Um, especially when the individuals working with these collections are not aware that these biases even exist. You know, makes me wonder how we reflect uh, on not only the archival level, but also on the individual. And, you know, I personally think that, especially with audiovisual collections, so focused on preserving footage that the, the person get left behind. Um, and last, I'll speak about trauma-informed archival practice. Um, so Kristen Wright and Nicola Laurent out of Australia, you know, have hosted a number of art trauma informed archival practice workshops and kind of define them as a strength based approach for organizations that acknowledges the pervasiveness of trauma and the risk and potential for people to be re traumatized through engagement with organizations such as archives and seeks to minimize triggers and negative interactions, which is something I think is pertinent and related to broadcast media archives, definitely. Um, Wright and Laurent recently published a report titled Understanding the International Landscape of Trauma and Archives. Um, and based on the results of that survey, which I recommend everyone checking out, the document makes mention that 92% of recent archival graduates did not have material relating to trauma in their education. And 66% have not been exposed to such concepts um, after graduation. Um, Simmons University Library and Information Sciences had a great guide on trauma-informed archival practice that kind of outlines the different forms of archival trauma. You know, unfortunately, I can no longer find it on the web page, but I did take some quotes from it. Um, you know, it, it defined trauma ma traumatic material within the archives as typically records on catastrophic events or records and even finding aids themselves that describe a group of people with derogatory language um, they define secondary trauma as the trauma users and archivists can experience by interacting and absorbing archival material and institutional trauma you know the trauma that archives can create by how it provides access or describes groups of people so, you know, sometimes the subject matter of an object can, or collection can kind of be unknown to the archivist inspecting this material, you know, which I feel like can take them by surprise. You know, there'd be material that might be racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, uh, 
or especially in the case of broadcast media archives, you know, you've got local tragedies, you've got problematic histories, global conflict, human rights violations. Um, you know, I've spoken with a number of archivists in the past about how mentally draining working with this kind of material can be um, and is not something that was touched upon in their education. You know, it's always just been kind of like a, a just deal with it approach, which I, I don't think is helpful. Um, so I always like to come up with some strategies. Um, you know, but I think professional committees and organizations can act as a form of support group. You know, EMEA has a number of um, different committees. So I think maybe something that relates to problematic content, broadcast media archives, places where people can maybe just vent or have conversations with one another about working with this difficult material. Um, I think audiovisual workshops are critical about teaching about how to work with this difficult material. Um, I hosted uh, an archival accessibility workshop with a news broadcaster in Boston um, this last year, and it was particularly related to archives and problematic material. And everyone actually at the the new the broadcast found it helpful, and it was shared in various departments. So you know, instead of just having it be for journalists and being teaching journalists, it was actually help teaching archivists and helping everybody. Um, you know, I think including graphic warnings and cataloging, if not already, you know, people have different triggers, but I think it's important we're proactive. And you know, bringing awareness to students and interns about the difficulties of working in broadcast media archives. Um, you know, so I would say like if they're a broadcast media archive and you have an intern or think of maybe some choices of projects that an intern can work on if possible. Um, you know, students, interns, early career professionals may have trouble, difficulty speaking up if something is bothering them just because they're afraid of being, you know, difficult. Um, so coming across the, the 12 minute mark. So I just want to say once again, a big thank you for everyone for attending the presentation. Again, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I just want to know, I'd let you know, I also host archival accessibility workshops and do consultation work. So if you'd like to speak further on, you know, potential workshop, this panel, or anything relating to archival accessibility, I can be reached at marlatm at yorku.ca or www.archivistaccess.com, which currently directs to uh, my LinkedIn page. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've done some of that work myself. Um, so I, I'm a person who has, you know, depression, anxiety. Um, a lot of that comes from my, you know, I'm someone with, with epilepsy and kind of comes with that. Um, and I've done some work with medical film archives in the past and looked at, you know, the history of, of epilepsy on film, especially in the early 20th century um, and, you know, medical experiments and what have you. And, you know, just kind of realized how much of an impact that had on me and was not something that I felt was included in my education whatsoever. Um, so I, I think conversations, you know, like this are helpful. Um, I'd even say maybe themed conferences, um, more ac like literature, you know, there's really very little, if anything, on, um, you know, mental health accessibility in media archives. You know, I've done a lot of work my dissertation on the topic and and you know there's just more collaborative work i think we we all need to be doing in the field especially for you know early career professionals and and, and students right yeah no that's a, a great point and a great question um you know my thought process there is about I mean, a big part of its representation i think you know, I, I kind of spoke about just, you know, lived experiences and, and archival bias. And, you know, un unfortunately, there's a lot of missing perspectives in the field from underrepresented communities. A and I think if we have more archivists represent different identities and communities, you know, there's kind of a, a, a sensitivity there that we may be able to bring out 
into the community, uh, into various communities, and even just as a way to to educate on what archives are and what some of the work is and getting, you know, more, even just, you know, even if it's not a, a formal archival setting, but even just getting material out to community archives um, and, and within academia and, and, and elsewhere.